Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about numerical inverse kinematics. So, as you know, uh, based on our previous video, the general problem of inverse kinematics cannot always be solved analytically, right? There are specific conditions like the robot has to have six degrees of freedom and the last three joints form a spherical wrist then yes, we can definitely analytically solve it. Also, for some simpler robots with less than six degrees of freedom, like the planar arm to the OF or Scara or so on, there are analytic solutions available. But in general, uh, you cannot always solve these problems um, analytically. And if you remember in previous video, I showed you, for example, if for the Sanford arm, you give it a, a rotation matrix and you give it a um, position vector for end effector in base, then it leads to these 12 equations that you need to solve for six unknowns uh, because you also have some extra six constraints between the components of this um, rotation matrix. Then you have to deal with a bunch of nonlinear equations, which in general you cannot solve. So sometimes there is no way we have to resort to numerical solutions and we want to know which methods we have in our disposal to solve these set of nonlinear equations numerically. One of the most famous method and yet the fastest method for uh, solving any uh, nonlinear equation or set of nonlinear equations is what we call the newton raphson or NR method which is uh, based on the uh, slope of the tangent line of the function. So here, I demonstrate this method to you in 1D. So I assume that we only have one equation, one unknown. I'll show you the graphics of how this method works, and then we can extend it to several equations and several um, variables. So if you consider here, I have this uh, nonlinear function y equal f of x and I want to find the root which is here, correct? I want to find the zero of the function. Now what I will do is this. I start with some initial guess. Let's say I say here I think the uh, y at this location x of n, x of n should be zero. Well, most probably you are not that lucky to exactly hit it with just a guess. So probably your point, if you project it on the function, is going to end up here, definitely not equal to zero. So this is your initial guess. Fine. Now what would you do is you draw the tangent line at that location, which is this line here, if you look. You draw the tangent line at that location and let that tangent line hit the x-axis. Well, the equation of a tangent line is not such a big deal, right? Everybody can find the equation of a line at a given point, correct? Because you know the location of the point xn and f of xn, and the slope of the tangent line, as you know, is f prime at the xn, correct? The first derivative is the slope of the tangent line. So the equation of this line is clearly what? It is y minus uh, f at xn, which is y at that location, is equal to the slope of the line, which is f prime at xn, times x minus xn, correct? So that's the equation of the line. And then you look and see, and you can see that here too. And then you will see where that... Um, uh, location where well, that line I'm sorry is going to intersect the x-axis where when you intersect the x-axis it means y has to be what zero right and then from here from here you can find what you can find the x of the impact point which is you can call it the next guess point x of n plus one so from here clearly you'll see that x of n plus one is going to be what it's going to be x of n that you take to the other side, and then minus f of x divided by f prime of x, which you can see here. So the next guess can be calculated based on the previous guess, right? This is the previous guess. 
This is the derivative at the previous guess, which is inverted and then multiplied by the value of the function at the previous guess. So as you can see here, if I know value of xn and I'm given the function f of x, which of course I should, then from this formula, I can get what? x of n plus 1. And then I repeat this process. Again, I project xn plus 1 on the curve. I come down to this point. At this point, again, I'm drawing my tangent line, which is this guy. I get the equation like that. I set it to where uh, y becomes 0 or it hits the x-axis. That gives me my next guess, which I call xn plus 2. And as you can see, if I do that again here and draw the tangent line, now my next guess is going to come end up probably here. And if you now look at the locations of these points, correct? So um, this is my first guess in red. The second guess in green is uh, this guy. The third guess is in blue. The fourth guess is in what? In orange. And as you can see, if you look at the trend, you see clearly these points are getting closer and closer to what? To this point in black, which is the actual root. Right? So just by a few iterations, as long as you are following the slope, you are following the direction of the descent, the slope of the curve, you are able to get closer and closer to the actual solution, right? And you can show that because this method is an, uh, basically a smart method, taking advantage of the slope and moves in the direction of the negative slope. You see clearly here, the direction is negative slope, right? And uh, that allows for you to, uh, what we call, use steepest descent, okay? So a generalized version of this is what we call steepest descent, and that is using the slope of the tangent line, okay? Because the slope of the tangent line at any point is the fastest that you can go down on a curve. In um, When it's more than 1D, so you have a function of several variables, the general, generalized version or multi-dimensional version of this, instead of using the um, derivative, simple derivative, you use basically the um, uh, multi-dimensional derivative, which if you remember, it is called what? Yes, it is called del f, correct? The uh, divergence, right? Del f, the partial derivative which has a partial derivative of f with respect to xi, partial derivative of f with respect to yj, let's say with respect to zk, and so on. So if you move in the direction of negative of this guy, then it is the fastest direction of going down on the curve and finally meeting uh, your um, uh, intersection point. Or if your point that you start with is already below the x-axis, once you follow that, you are going to go up along the curve and get to uh, the intersection point, okay? So this method provides a very fast convergence, and you can show that the uh, convergence of this is quite faster than many other numerical methods that we have, which do not take advantage of the derivative, because there are other algorithms for solving um, numerical uh, algebraic, uh, for solving, I'm sorry, nonlinear algebraic equations, right? It's just enough that you go to my channel, go to playlists, go to uh, engineering mathematics. And then if you go down here, you should be able to find numerical solution or root finding of nonlinear algebraic equations. So please watch this video. Here I discuss several algorithms for solving nonlinear algebraic equations. And um, the first one is like bisection method. Then we have the uh, regular Farsi method. Then we have this newton raphson method and so on. So uh, this is one of the fastest. And it can converge quite fast to the solution in a few iterations, right? Now... This was, this demonstration and this formula that we developed here was um, 
for a 1D function. By the way, a formula like this, you know, we call it a recursive formula because you can plug in the value from previous or pre previous iteration or iterations and it gives you the current value and you can keep repeating that. So this is what we call a recursive formula. Now, uh, if it happens that your function that you are going to find is not just a simple variable, you have more than one variable and therefore you have more than one equation to solve at the same time. So you have a system of equations with several variables, let's say three functions and three variables, then you can uh, basically generalize this formula into the vector format. So if you look at this formula, which is very similar to the top one here, this X, which is in bold font, it involves more than one variable. It is a vector of variables. This capital F also, which is in bold font, this is what? This is a vector of several functions, okay? And so you are taking the partial derivative of several functions with respect to several variables, right? So what you have, what you can see here is not a single derivative. Here you have several functions, derivative of them with respect to several variables, right? And uh, what do we call this matrix? If you remember, this is what we call the Jacobian matrix, correct? This is what we call a Jacobian matrix. A Jacobian matrix is defined for several functions, partial derivative with respect to several variables. So you invert the Jacobian matrix, and here is not just reciprocal like this, because this is a matrix. You cannot take reciprocal of a matrix, but you can use what? The inverse of that matrix, and then multiply it by this vector f, which is evaluated at xm. Okay, and I'll show you an example of that. I applied for the two degree of freedom um, robotic arm, and I'll show you how to apply this properly to that, which involves two equations and two unknowns. So how to formulate this for it, and then I'll show you a MATLAB demo. But before that, although this, uh, let me uh, explain a little bit about the um, limitations of this method too, or the problems, the traps of this method, basically, the caveats. So we learned that this method is very fast, and it is. The problem is this initial guess. Okay, it depends on where you selected this initial guess. Sometimes your initial guess is not going to lead to a root at all, or it might lead to something that you probably did not even aim at. Like what? So let's look at some different scenarios where this method can um, uh, either give you a wrong answer or a different answer. So uh, case number one is this. Your function looks like this. It has basically positive and negative curvatures. And your goal is to get to this root here, correct? Right? And you start quite close to it. So you say, well, I think this point, this I, I here, this location is my root. This is your actual root. You start close to it, but not, of course, very, very close, because you have to be very lucky. So you just, what? You just start here. And follow the direction of what? The tangent line. So you draw the tangent line here and let it intersect the x-axis. It takes you here. You project it on the curve. You draw the tangent again. And it takes you here. And then what? You follow here the point And you follow the curve. And you end up here, actually. So if you do several tangents here, you end up here. So although I wanted to go from here to there, I ended up going from here to here. I found another route. I did not even find this route that was also close to it. I found a route that was quite far away. So sometimes it gives you another route that is not close to your guess. At least this is not too bad, right? You did not find the route you probably were thinking, but at least you could find another one. Sometimes it does not go to any root at all, and that is when your function is like this, okay? That you go from a positive curvature to a negative curvature. So here, your root is like this. That's the root. And you start close to it, let's say, at this location here. So you say, this is my location. This is my guess. Look what happens. You go up, you draw the tangent, it brings you here. You go down, you draw the tangent, it brings you here. You keep repeating that. You go here, you go here. 
And if you repeat that, you see that in either direction, as you can see, I'm getting what? Away from the initial point. And of course, away from the actual solution. So I will never converge to this um, root here. What we have, we call it divergence. You will never get to it because the direction of the curvature is like that. If the direction of curvature was opposite of that, so instead of going positive to negative, you could go negative to positive. So something like this, then maybe when you, uh, this is the case and you start here, right? When you start following the slope, may or may not, like look here, I put it here and um, I draw a tangent, which brings me here, it brings me down there. Here I draw another tangent and you see a couple of these is enough to get me there. So when I go from this negative to positive curvature, I can easily converge. But when I go from positive to negative curvature here, and this is like an inflection point as well as a root, then I can diverge. And the other thing that is the most common problem in this method is called being trapped in a local minima. Okay, this trapping is the most common case. So here is your root. And you start here. What happens is you go to that point, draw a tangent, brings you here, you go up, takes you here, and then what? You keep repeating that kind of. At best, you ultimately will converge to a point there. Okay, and over time, you're not going to change too much. So instead of going to a root, you are trapped in what? A local minima. And this is very, very common in this method. So you see, although this method is really good, it can converge very fast, and I'll show you in a MATLAB demo. It's a very good method, fast convergence. The problem this method has is uh, the initial guess, really. If your initial guess is in the right location, and most of the time relatively maybe close to the root, this method is very good. It can converge, but sometimes, as I said, it doesn't converge at all, or it converges to a, a local minimum, which is not a root, and it never leaves that point. There is also another problem that I don't have in here, but if it happens that your function has flat areas, so your function is kind of something like this, okay, and this is your root here. If it has flat areas, or we call plateaus, if we start here and try to go with the direction of the tangent, the problem is tangent line is never going to intersect my x-axis. It's horizontal. Okay? Or if the point you start is right at the maximum, let's say, or a minimum, still the tangent is what? Horizontal, so your tangent line is not going to cut the x-axis at all. And that means when basically this guy here is zero. When this is zero, the inverse of that is infinity or having division by zero, so you will never get anything. Okay, so this derivative term should not be zero at your initial guess. If it is, you're not gonna go anywhere. You have to try another point. Okay, so if there are uh, what we call plateaus, flat areas. Now, if it's just a simple max like this, that's not a big deal. If it's like this, well, you tried that point here, it didn't work. Now you move it a little bit to the left or right, now you get the working point. So this point, if you follow the tangent, it is going to get you there, most probably, right? But when it's a flat area, it doesn't matter if you move your initial guess a little bit to the left or right, still, that's completely flat area. Okay, and so that's where there are other uh, modified versions of this newton raphson that the update criterion or the recursive equation 
for uh, those is a little bit um, uh, different from what you can see here. So they say that, for example, if there is a flat area, just keep moving in one direction. Don't care about the direction of the slope. Just move in one direction at random to get what? Not at random, but consistently. Try to get out of the flat region. And once you're out of the flat region and you see some slope, now try to follow the slope. Okay? Because, and this is happening especially in multidimensional surfaces. Because in multidimensional surfaces, when you look at the surface, there are probably some ups and some downs and stuff. But there are some huge areas here that are completely flat, right? So uh, let me show you that as well here. Um, so 3D surfaces or a surface plot. Many of these surfaces, I want to show you something realistic because, yeah, there's many of them look so good, but the matter of fact is um, not all of them are super realistic for many of the optimization problems. Many of them look something like this. There are some ups and downs, or this one, maybe the MATLAB surface itself. There are some ups and downs areas and some probably roots, but there are some big flat areas, especially as you get away from your min and max and in these flat areas it's not really such a good idea to follow the slope or let the slope decide how much you are moving so there are other um, modified versions of this and one of them is called Levenberg Marquardt okay so this uh, method is basically like the newton raphson method but it is a um, modified version to uh, take care of the flat areas and this is what you do probably in many of your neural network systems when you are trying to uh, train the system solve equations and so on and find the gains this is one of the algorithms you use for convergence Anyways, going back to this, so you see the problem here lies in the initial guess. Your initial guess sometimes leads to something, sometimes doesn't. So what should we do if it doesn't? Then you should try a new point. That's all it is. If it doesn't work, then you try another new point and try a bunch of times until you see it is converging to something. And um, I talked about convergence in that video I just showed you on my channel. But convergence means what? Well, your goal is at whatever the iteration is, the value of function is what? Approximately zero, so you can find the root. So if you see as your um, n gets bigger and bigger and you get to newer and newer and newer points, if you see the value of your function is what? Decreasing. So you look at the absolute value of the function at the current iteration. If you see this guy is going down as n goes up, it means what? It means convergence, correct? Right? That's a convergence. Or you see the difference between subsequent n, x n's are going down. So like x n plus 1 minus x n, also this guy here should go down and as n goes up. So this means you are converging to somewhere. Now, does it mean where you are converging, you are converging to a root? No, because if you look here, uh, you can converge to somewhere, but the place that you converge could not be a root. So the fact that the difference between subsequent x values is getting smaller and smaller, it doesn't mean you actually converge to a root. It just means you are converging to somewhere. Is that the root? I have to check this one as well. Okay. So these two together, I would say, is a very good way of looking at it. Okay, Because maybe just by chance, at some iteration, your value falls close to the root, but then in the next iteration and so on, it gets away. Okay, So it not really is converging, it's diverging. 
it just happened that in one of your guesses you uh, your point fell very close to the root but it's not really converging to it it is diverging so you need to have both of these right so you can say for example when this guy is less than some threshold epsilon and this one is less than some threshold delta when it gets bigger and bigger then i can say i have converged and you also have to have a limit on this n, okay? This n should be, what, less than some n max. You should not just let this guy go forever because sometimes you are really being trapped like this or you are diverging. So you see that none of this is happening and your n just keeps increasing. So you cannot let your algorithm fall into an infinite loop. You have to stop it at some point. Say, hey, if you have gone more than a thousand iterations and nothing happened, these two conditions are not satisfied, go ahead and stop it, right? So you clearly see if you want your algorithm to work, you need to have a maximum number of iterations and you have to have some thresholds for what? For the uh, values of your um, function at the solution and the difference between the uh, subsequent uh, values especially this epsilon definitely is so important okay this guy is absolutely important and this n max is absolutely important you need to have those to assure convergence now as i said if you have more than one equation we have to use four uh, vectors and matrices right and i said i'm going to show you a demo of that with the two degree of freedom planner arm so let's do that so if you remember when we uh, talked about the planar arm in one of our uh, previous videos, I showed you that the equations you are going to solve are what? So here are the two members. This is your end effector. The location of that is given by YE. And XE. The length of the members are A1 and A2. And the angles are theta 1 and theta 2. And the equations you have to solve are this. A1 cosine of theta 1 plus A2 times cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2 is equal to X of E. And similarly, a1 sine of theta 1 plus a2 sine of theta 1 plus theta 2 is equal to y of e. Right? So you have to solve these equations for theta 1 and theta 2 clearly, two nonlinear equations and two unknowns. The first thing you do is you convert it into a root finding problem. So basically, convert each one of these equations into something like this, f of x equals 0, right? How do I do that? Well, that's not such a hard thing. All you need is to bring the uh, constants x, e, and y, e to the left-hand side and set them equal to what? 0. So clearly, you see now, I have two equations, and I need to find the root of them, see when they are 0. So now this is what you do. This guy here, you call it F1 of theta 1 and theta 2. And this function here, this bottom one, you call it F2 of theta 1 and theta 2. So there are two functions, F1 and F2. Both of them have to be 0 for the values of theta 1 and theta 2, correct? So uh, let's see how we get it to happen. 
So here we have to deal with matrices and vectors. So what I do is I put F1 and F2 in a vector, call it vector F. So here my vector F, which is a function of theta1 and theta2, is going to be what? F1 as the first element of it and F2 as the second element of it. I also form vector x here, and x here means the two unknowns. So it is going to be what? Theta 1 and theta 2. So I can also call this what? I can call it f of x, right? Because theta 1 and 2 is x. So this is like f1 of x and what? f2 of x. You see, that's this notation that we had here. Correct? This is the notation that we had over here. That, um, if instead of the single function f of x, you had a, a vector f of x, right? like this okay so this is f and this is x and it's equal to a vector of zeros several zeros if you have that then the solution is going to be what you can see here in this recursive equation Right, so let's go and take a look. So this is our notation, right? Good. So now the update equation says what? It says f at iterate uh, solution at iteration n plus one is the solution at iteration n minus the inverse of the Jacobian times the value of the function calculated at x n. Good. So what does it mean? So it means that x n plus 1, when you put n here, it means theta 1 in iteration n, and what? Theta 2 in iteration n, correct? So it means, when you say x n plus 1, it means theta 1 in iteration n plus 1, and theta 2, or if you want, I can use parentheses, maybe that's a little bit nicer to use comma. So I can say something like this, theta 1 in iteration n plus 1, and theta 2 in iteration n plus 1. This is equal to whatever they were in iteration 1, minus, minus what? Minus the Jacobian. Jacobian means partial derivative of f functions with respect to the thetas. So if I want to calculate that Jacobian here, which was partial of f with respect to x, what does it mean in this case with that definition of f and x? It means partial of f1 with respect to theta1, partial of f1 with respect to theta2, partial of f2 with respect to theta1, partial or f2 with respect to what? Theta 2, as I said, we call this guy what? A Jacobian matrix. Okay, each row of it, the function is fixed, the variables are changing. The next one is for f2, the variables are changing. If there is more f3, the variables, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and so on. Okay, so this is what you hopefully know from your calculus. So now let's go and take derivatives. So what's the partial of f1 with respect to theta1? Here you have negative a1 sine theta1. And then this one is going to be negative a2 times sine of theta1 plus theta2. Right, and x is constant number, there is no derivative in it. 
you can calculate also F2 with respect to theta 1. It is going to be A1 cosine of theta 1 and then um, plus A2 times cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2. Good. And then similarly, you take derivative with respect to theta 2, so that's going to be negative a2 sine of theta 1 plus theta 2. And this is going to be a2 cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2. These are the partials with respect to theta 2. Good. So now this matrix has to be calculated at each iteration for values of x and for values of theta 1 and theta 2. That's my matrix. So I calculate this guy at each iteration where theta 1 and theta 2 are in their nth iteration. Invert it and then multiply it by the values of f. So if I want to write it, it is going to be the inverse of a matrix. Times a vector. What matrix? This very same matrix. So if I want to write it down, it's going to be negative a1 times sine of theta 1 in iteration n minus a2 times sine of theta 1 in iteration n plus theta 2 in iteration n. Then here I have a1 cosine of theta 1 in iteration n plus a2 times cosine of theta 1 in iteration n plus theta 2 in iteration n. And then here I simply only have negative a2 times sine of theta 1 in iteration n and a2 times cosine of theta uh, as theta 1 plus 2. Okay, so I have to calculate this matrix, invert it, and then multiply it by the values of F1 and F2 calculated at iteration n, which are these two functions. So it is going to be A1 times cosine of theta 1 in iteration n plus A2 times cosine of theta 1 in iteration n plus theta 2 in iteration n minus x of e. And then similarly, A1 sine of theta 1 in iteration n plus A2 times sine of theta 1 in iteration n plus theta 2 in iteration n minus y of e. Okay, so this here, this big thing here, is going to be your update equation. This one. Just for what? Just for this 2 by 2 problem. At each iteration, theta 1 and theta 2 n. So you start with some initial guess for these two numbers. You calculate all of this, and that will give you theta 1 and 2 in the next iteration. 
then you bring those and plug them back here it gives you theta one and two in the next one and keep going until your convergence criteria are uh, matched and if it doesn't so you don't converge and and or your iteration max is uh, reached and you haven't been there then you haven't been to the uh, root then you will say divergence and then when divergence happens what would you do you try a new guess you try a new initial values for theta one and two and repeat the process okay so that is what we call a numerical solution and you see again this one now here let me show you the example in MATLAB okay so here you can see I'm using max iteration of a hundred and I'm using an error of one over hundred so you know you will uh, it takes it might take forever for you to exactly converge to the actual solution so if you are just close enough you might say I have converged so what I used here for this epsilon is 0.01 and for n max I use a hundred iterations I did not use Delta in this code but I can incorporate that that's not such a hard thing so uh, if I'm below 1 over 100, I say I'm practically 0, and as long as it's not taking more than 100 iterations, okay? So I set up my parameters here, then I'm asking you to input your length of the two members, L1 and L2. In this case, they are the same as what? A1 and A2, and then I'm asking you to enter the end effector position. So here it is written as Y and Z, not X and Y, but again it's not going to change anything so if i want i can select this and say hey make this for me a1 and then do a shift enter and change every l1 to a1 as far as i can see and then this one also a2 then do a shift enter make all of it a2 then go to um, ye change it all to xe finally make ZE to be what YE and shift enter right so I can easily change my notations to match these formulas okay so now it's exactly there and here max iteration is good if you want I can call it in max and max error I can call it epsilon okay and shift enter now make sure you don't say EPS, EPS, because that is a reserve keyword. So use the Epsilon. And here I just want to make sure Epsilon. Uh, make sure it is not a reserve keyword or a function. And it seems like it is. It is a function. So it's not a good idea to call it Epsilon. I change it to something else. I call it... Um, if I go back, it was called max error. Let's say that's that's good enough. So here we run this. It says, okay, what's the length of the link? So let's say my first um, length is uh, what? Um, 200 mil or 20 centimeters. And my second link is 150. It says, okay, now what is your X and what is your Y? So here you have to make sure that your X and Y that you give it is not outside the workspace. If you see here, the maximum radius I can reach is A plus B, which is 350, and the minimum I can reach is 50. So make sure the radial distance from your end effector that you are entering to the origin is bigger than 50 and less than 350. Otherwise, it's not going to be happy because it's not going to converge to anything regardless of uh, what your initial guess is. So I'll try to put it somewhere reasonable. So I may say, well, how about um, 250? And how about, uh, so you have to here make sure that the square of 250 and the square of this number is less than 350, okay? So um, if I say 50, I don't think it is gonna be more than that. And what is your initial guess for theta 1 in degrees? So I say, I don't know, maybe 30 degrees. What's your guess for theta 2? Maybe 60 degrees. I don't know. Let it see if it converges. Now, for this uh, 
code to work, as you can see here, I also need FK2. What is that one? Well, let's go and look at the algorithm. Well, here, I get my guesses, and as long as my iteration is below max iteration, an error is more than the error, it keeps working. It calculates this uh, mat one. This mat one here is exactly your Jacobian. So it is this guy. Matrix one. And the matrix two that you see in that code is this guy here, this vector actually. Okay, so that's what you see in this code. They are defined exactly. I add to the loop counter and then I apply my, um, where is that here, my update equation. Okay, so I apply my update equation. The only thing is I have to keep track of the error, right? I have to keep track of the error and see how much error I have, whether the error falls below threshold and I converge or no, it's above the threshold and I should keep trying. Right, so how do I get my error? Well, if you look, your errors are these two terms actually. This matrix 2 is your error already. This is your error, and this is what your error ideally, right? Because um, when these two terms are zero, it means you exactly converge, and your error should be what zero. So if these two terms are zero, you converge your thetas are not going to be updated anymore because this whole thing is going to be zero, right? So these two terms are actually your error. And so here I use the function to do that, but actually that's the same as this mat2. This mat2 is my error. So I can, here this error i is simply actually this matrix number 2. And... Um, the only thing here is I'm comparing here one number to the error, not a vector to the error, because this mat2 is really what? A matrix. You cannot compare a matrix to an error. You need to compare a single number to a single number. So if I want, instead of all of this, I can say that error i is simply what? It is the norm of the matrix number 2. And that's it. And then this is going to plot for me the results. So let me do it one more time. But uh, before that, I would like to check and make sure my point that I tried is not outside the range. Yeah, you clearly see this is not 350. And I can probably even go up here. Yeah, this is definitely less than uh, 350. So we can try that. So let's do it. So 200, 150, 250, and 100. My guesses are 30 and let's say 45 or 60, doesn't matter. Let's see if it converges to anything. There we go. It seems like it went all the way to 100 iterations and could not converge. As you can see, my, uh, or did it? No, it did, I guess. I is 6. So it did not go all the way up to 100 iteration. Let's look at that figure. And let's look at the plots. Uh, here we go. So... It seems like... The error is going down, and it seems like one of my angles is going negative theta 1, the other one is going close to 1.5 positive, and I don't see that very well in here. Because uh, theoretically, what I'm doing is This is the point 250, so let me see if I can use units of 50 here. So your point is here. Your first link is like 200, the other one is like 150. So what you need is to get there, 
is for this first member to come down and then for this member to go like that right now maybe I need to change it a little bit but probably something like this right where this is 150 and this guy is 200 so this is a possible solution theta 1 becomes negative theta 2 is a positive number now in this case uh, if you look we have a negative and a positive but uh, the plot does not look too nice to me and I guess the reason for it is it is outside the axis range the axis range is a limited range that's why if you look here my axis range is uh, small so maybe I have to do it like this and repeat that so again 200 150 250 uh, 100 right and I use 30 and 45 there we go yes so you clearly see here that um, this is your goal point here and it could reach it right this is the first member this is the second member you can reach it and it shows the uh, robot matching where I wanted it to be and you see the plus for theta 1 and theta 2 are converging to a low number and your error is dropping right now here I would like to redo this and just for the sake of experiment make this more accurate so let's say 10 to the negative 3 100 iteration should be enough and uh, when I plot these members here for visualization, I would probably use a different color. Okay, maybe the first member I use a different color. Let's make it black. The second member, leave it as blue. Then the uh, point to be going to is GO and it's a green circle I would say well let's make it a red circle and fill it with red and the rest of it should be okay so let's do it one more time just for the sake of learning 250 oh I made it longer it was 200 200 150 were the links then you went to 250 and 100 and here let's try a different guess so we did 30 and 45 here I do like maybe what 10 degrees and uh, let's say 60 degrees right see if it still converges and you see still in six iterations it is converging your error is falling below one over a thousand which is a small number and again yes I am converging to where I should be converging right so it is working just fine and I'll do it one last time and try to make it even tighter okay see if the number of iteration goes up so again uh what it was 200 and 150 then we had 250 and 100 we used the very same guess we did last time 10 and 60 right so all i'm doing i did not change the guess i just made the convergence criterion a little bit tighter which means you it has to be more accurate 
see if the number of iterations go up because typically that's what happens, right? When you are asking the numerical solver to be very accurate, it needs more iterations to converge to that amount of accuracy. Okay, I have not changed anything, and guess what? In this case, it doesn't really need to go way higher. Six iterations is enough for it still, because actually it can converge to a very, very small number. And you clearly can see that it is going fine. If you just need to know how much was your error, look at the history of the error. You see, it was practically zero. It's not really zero. All you need is to go with format long. And look at the error again. See what is the last value of the error. Right? It is this much. Look. It is 10 to the what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Your last error is below 10 to the negative 8 in only 6 iterations. You see how accurate you can get to the actual location was very accurate okay so you see the power of this method and I tried a couple of different um, guesses it worked I can even if you want try something off now let's go because I know my theta 1 has to be negative my theta 2 is going to be some big number let me try something quite off here see if I get to any solution so I make my theta 1 big, make it 90 degrees, and my theta 2, which is a big number, I make it negative. Correct? So I completely reverse it. Let's see. And again, it converges, but look at the interesting thing here. It converts to what? It converts to the second configuration. Remember the previous one was like this? Now that was elbow down. Now you're converging to what? To the elbow up. Right? Because my guess was closer to, there are, you know, there are two solutions here. Elbow up and elbow down. My initial guess was closer to elbow up, not elbow down. So you clearly can see what is happening, right? I'm converging to the elbow up here. Right? And it could do it in nine iterations here. So how fast you are converging, whether you are converging or not, and what solution you are converging to all depends on this initial guess. Once you change it, you might not get anywhere, you might get to a different place, and or you might get to the same place but in more iterations. Okay, it all depends on this initial guess as well as what, of course, this error, right? Because not you are always lucky and you can get the error so low. So hopefully I could get uh, the uh, topic clear to you of the newton raphson method. We applied it to a simple robot here, but the basic is the same. You can apply it to any number of equations and any number of unknowns for the inverse kinematics problem. So I'll stop the lecture here. And there are three more algorithms for numerical inverse kinematics. One of them is called differential. Uh, inverse kinematics, which is using unit quaternion. One of them is called the cyclic coordinate descent CCD, and the other one is called forward-backward reaching inverse kinematics or fabric. So in the future videos, I'm going to talk about each one of these nice algorithms. Okay, thank you so much.